Hey everyone, it's Jim from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today, in tube lab number 77, we're going to talk about broken octal keys and a whole bunch more. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. If you've been around tubes for any length of time, you've probably come across a broken octal key or two. Because I handle thousands of octals in a year, I see more than my fair share. Generally, I throw them out, unless they are high-value tubes. So what can we do? Well, I think first we need to figure out how the keys are being broken, how to avoid it happening to you, and what we can do if we have a broken key. Okay, so let's just start and see if we can break a key. Now, in an earlier shoot, I actually snapped a key off really easily. This is, this is it's branded G, but this is actually a, um, an elevated black T-plate uh, that is made by um, Marconi. It's a 6SN7 GTB. They're fabulous sounding tubes, but like many of the elevated T-plate designs, they are prone to being noisy, probably because the uh, uh, assembly is so far up and into the tube. But that's just a guess. It could be the earlier GT spec uh, that was this design lends to it. I don't know. Anyways, that's not what we're talking about, really. So. Let's just see how easy these are to break. Well, this one's not that easy. In an earlier shoot, I snapped off a Sylvania GTA guide pin quite easily. It took a little bit of work, but it, it came off. This one's not, so it's in really... In fact, the tube looks, uh, looks new old stock, doesn't it? So the plastic's in really good shape. Uh, it probably hadn't been installed in an amp prior to me getting it, but it's a noisy tube, so unfortunately it's garbage. I don't sell noisy tubes. <laughs> Not deliberately, anyways. What about these? Well, these got me thinking about this, plus a customer who talked a little bit about uh, breaking off a bunch of keys. So this is rebranded uh, Reliable. It's got a little mark here. This, In fact, this is, before I forget, this is what you can do if you have a broken key on a valuable tube. What I do is I take a little bit of masking tape, I just tape off a tiny, not a big mark, a little mark like that, and I take white out. That's what typists used to use to cover mistakes <laughs> going way back. Um, shit, I used to use this stuff. Anyways, it's still commonly available in dollar stores. And I just put one big fat blob of it across the tape. I take the tape off right away, and then Bob's your uncle, you've got a key mark. And we'll see a little bit more about how to install octals safely. So these two are tall boy tongue saws. Have a look at this. Now, a lot of tongue saw writing is not so good. And one of the big problems with tongue saw tubes is they often have electrical mismatch problems. They're often noisy. Uh, they're sh relatively short-lived tubes. If they didn't sound so m amazing, I was going to use another word, <laughs> um, I'd never touch them. Uh, but th these tubes sound fabulous. So anyways, I had a couple in this batch that came in. I had quite a few actually with broken keys, but I had a pair that were really close matched. And I thought, well, why don't I try them in my Universal 6 or 12 SN7 kit preamp and see just see how they sound before I chuck them. And oh my God, I almost fell out of my chair. They sounded amazing. The level of detail was just extraordinary. And I have a very highly resolving system. So I hear detail all the time. This was another level. Um, and what really floored me is, is listening to a, a, one of my favorite live concerts. It's um, Anwar Braham uh, Trio with um, John Cernum, um on bass clarinet 
and um, who was on the bass? Um, oh my goodness, I've forgotten his name now. He's just a fabulous bassist. It'll come to me eventually. Anyways, these guys are some of the best players in the world. And I li was listening at one point and I could hear the flutter of a reed. And I thought, holy man, that is just amazing. Now, if you're not an audiophile or you're just getting into being an audiophile, uh, careful, it's a rabbit hole. <laughs> it's a pleasant rabbit hole, but it's a rabbit hole. And audiophiles love resolution. They love detail. Uh, sure, they love a lot of other things, but detail and resolution, those are biggies. <laughs> so when I heard that reed fluttering, and I've listened to this live album many times. Uh, it's Thymar. Thymar, I think, is how you pronounce it, live. And it's not a totally uh, official release, shall we say. <laughs> but it should should have been. Anyways, um, yeah, so that's that's the tongue cells. We'll talk a bit more about them in a minute. So how do we install octals so that we don't break the bloody keys? Okay, well, let's clear the decks and put these somewhere safe. Okay, so this is the little Yuri monoblock, and the power tube, both tubes are octals, but they both have top caps, as you can see. Um, and I'm just going to try to get it so you can see it best. Now, this is a fine tube to be using as a demonstration because its socket is elevated, or on the top plate. One of the problems that's causing people, I think, a lot of trouble is sunken sockets. So when you have a printed circuit board, a PCB mounted socket, modern manufacturers put the bloody thing below the top plate and sink it. Some of them do it really neatly, so it looks pleasant. And I think a lot of them were uh, doing it for aesthetic reasons to keep the tubes less visible. In my opinion, it's a terrible design flaw and it means that you can't easily see what's going on. So I've lost my little flashlight, but I have a little mini uh, LED flashlight. If you have a sunken socket, get it, get your little flashlight on and have a look as to where that key is. So I can see it, it's right here facing this way. This is how I, uh, let me show you how not to install octal tubes. Some people were taught to do this, to rotate until they feel it click and then shove it in. Well, if you don't get that key in the right spot, you're gonna jam this little tiny index into the side here, and when you pull the tube out, guess what? And of course, your pins aren't gonna be aligned either. So this is, this is the single most important thing to do when you're setting up an amplifier with new tubes is to get the tubes in properly in the right spot. <laughs> Believe me, it happens. People put tubes in the wrong sockets and get them aligned properly. So what I do is I find out where that where that index key is. There it is. I see it is right here. I see where the, the keyway is on the socket. I line them up visually. Even if it's sunken, I use a flashlight and I push it straight down and in. Now, out it comes with a little wiggle. Pull straight up. Not a big wiggle, you're gonna do some damage. Now, where I think people are getting into trouble is a lot of tube fans are buying new equipment these days. Yeah, and you're gonna have brand new sockets. And brand new sockets are tight. They should be tight, but they're gonna to be too tight. So you've got to break them in or wear them in. So what you need is an old crappy tube or a socket saver, a good quality socket saver. Um, do the same thing. You're going to line it up, pop it into your fresh socket. It's going to be tough at first, so take your time to get it in right. You're going to wiggle it a bit more than usual to get it out, but don't go too far or you'll snap the pin. And you're going to work it in like this. You're going to keep doing that carefully. Don't do this when you're not awake. You don't want to bust something on your brand new amp and work the socket in. Same thing for miniature nine pins. If you don't have a socket saver or you don't have a sacrificial octal tube or whatever type of tube you need, 
give me a shout, put a little order in, and I'll throw in um, a spare tube that you can use as a break-in tube. I send them off quite often. Uh, trust me, I throw out hundreds of tubes every month. Well, maybe not hundreds. Maybe about 100 or 200. Anyways, that's hundreds. <laughs> uh, I don't keep any garbage. I try not to sell any garbage. Period. I don't. You'll never see a listing from me saying um, barely acceptable tube for sale cheap. <laughs> Those are garbage tubes in my opinion. Okay. All right. Enough fun with that. Let's move this aside. So what is going on over at Melatone Kits? Well, the E80CC test builders are now all finished. And we didn't have any significant build issues, though we have had many helpful suggestions from the test builders, which has been really helpful. In fact, the test builders, by and large, have been really great. They've been patient, they've been careful in their builds, they've been doing great builds. I'm really pleased to see some of them are building better than I can. Um, that shows you the level of, of care and detail that they, they take. And, um, and that's, that helps. Now, uh, the E80CC kit preamp and the URI monoblock are now available to everybody. Anyone can buy one. It's going to be a little while before we have um, the CNC production plates in the store, but that's coming. Charles is working feverishly <laughs> on getting our new CNC up and running. That thing is a beast. We're going to do uh, we're going to do some live video of it working. It's just phenomenal what we've bought. I mean, it's a big investment, but Charles is the computer guy and a tube guy, so he's the chief operating engineer, <laughs> and he's I think he's having fun with it. So, anyways, I'm leaving him to that. I'll help him load the sheets. <laughs> Okay, so what's, what's left that needs test builders is the Universal 6 or 12 SN7 kit preamp. This is the one I use every day in my system. I love the clarity and drive of the 80cc tube, but I also love the warm, rich sound of the 6 or 12 SN7 tube. Remember, the only difference between a 6 SN7 and a 12 SN7 is the filament itself. The tube is identical in every way. And the spec sheets prove that. So, what you get if you're a test builder is uh, a little set of requirements. The key is that you must build the kit to specifications. I never thought I'd have to say that, but I actually have to put it in writing. <laughs> test builders are mavericks, so they like to do their own mods and stuff. Um, which is fine if you're not a test builder. Go ahead and mod the kit. Um, but we put hundreds of hours into designing these things and do critical listening tests. So we've already modded it um, and it sounds as good as we can get it. But you're going to get, if you agree to be a test builder, you're going to get a premium set of tubes included for free. Let's just take a look at what's going to come out with the Universal 6 or 12 SN7. Currently I have enough of these. It's a Jan or Milspec 12 SN7 GT by Sylvania packed on two of 67. So we know they were built just before February of 1967. This is one of my favorite 6 or 12 SN7 tubes. I love Sylvania tubes. Um, I love the warmth and richness. These are, they came new old stock, NIB, NOS, new in the box, NIB, new in the sleeve, NIS. <laughs> um, and they are probably, even though they're labeled GTs, built in 67, they were probably GTBs. They certainly, I put them in a difficult preamp circuit that was direct coupled. And um, that, uh, and that's, I featured that in an old, old tube lab. Anyways, um, and they survived that experience easily. So they definitely are a high spec tube. Anyways, this is one of the, I would put them in my top three, top five, six or 12 SN7s that I've ever heard. Anyways, they go out for free with the kits. It's a premium tube. Um, I've, had, I've had people 
ask me, what in the world are you doing sending out such a high value tube with your kits? Well, it's, it's a bit of a job to be a test builder. It's a responsibility. And when you're done, you're, I want your kit to sound as good as it possibly can. I want a good review. <laughs> and these, remember, these are the amplifiers. Yup, the tubes are the amplifiers. Everything else around it is just to facilitate the circuit, move the sound around, transformer, etc., etc. So, no wonder when you change out a set of tubes, you get a different sounding amplifier, because you did change the amplifiers. Okay, well, what came in this week? Well, I hinted at it earlier. Hang on. So, enough of these premium tubes came in that I was start able to start making up some pairs. So let's start with what's not in the store. <laughs> this is the first generation Tungsol mouse ear. It's the GT, 6SN7 GT, and the GTB is a tall boy. It's a little bit taller, same basic construction. You, I'm not going to put these in the store, probably. I have to go on a search to the inventory through the deep, the deep storage and see if I can find more, because I think I only have a half a dozen or so of these here. But I probably have more in storage. Um, but you can't play these on, you can't play any of the first generation 6SN7 GTs on a regular modern app. They're not, they're not designed to handle the higher voltages and the higher bias point that most of modern apps apply. So I never recommend them. And if you try them, you might get away with it, or you might end up making the tube noisy permanently, or worse, the tube might squeal like a stuck pig. Then you know you're screwed for sure. <laughs> and it's a terrible thing to do to a high quality tube. It's the reason, one of the primary reasons why I de developed and designed the Universal 6 or 12 SN7 Pre was so that we could play every 6 or 12 SN7 tube ever made, including the close variants, and especially the GTs. So I'm going to be playing these in mine as soon as I get a match pair together. Okay, what is in the store? Well, this is one of the best sounding 6 SN7s ever made. It's tough to see. This is the GTA straight plate version. I call it the number one AS in my store. This is the tube that came immediately after the bad boy, the GT Sylvanias, that are so famous and have so many noise issues. It's a shorter bottle. They took the getter and moved it to the top. And at the time, I don't think they knew if the technology was going to be that good. So they used a huge amount of gettering. So all of the, almost all of the early tubes have a large, large amount of gettering, which is a great thing. Some I think some people like it and some people hate it. It is a little sloppy looking. To me, it's the sign of a healthy tube. The more gettering that's intact, and you'll see a little bit of wear, a white edge on the older tubes, the more worn tubes, that's acceptable. You just don't want to see... I like to see two-thirds of the gettering intact to make a good tube. Below that, I start to think about throwing out the tube. It's just a sign that the tube's been worked hard or the vacuum is going on the tube. But at two-thirds, that's not bad. 66%, 70%, that's, that tube might have another decade or more of life left in it. These Sylvanias have that house sound, that warm, rich sound. But they have a little bit more detail. Now, there's an angled plate version after this that are almost as lovely. Here's the tongue saws. Can you see how the plates are angled slightly? That is about the most common pattern you'll see in the mid-production years to the end. Same with Sylvania. The next generation GTA went with the angled plates. Same tube. These have the edge on detail. They have, they have a, uh, a level of detail that you won't hear in any other Sylvania 6S and 7s, in my opinion. And they're high demand tubes, so they come in and they're gone almost right away. Another high demand tube that came in are these gorgeous Tungsol Tall Boys. And we were talking about these earlier. This one's rebranded, same tube. Um, the labels aren't that good on the Tungsols. 
tongues are terrible tubes. They, I mean, let me repeat that differently. They sound absolutely fabulous. They have a fair amount of warmth and richness. richness. They have a depth that just keeps on going. It's just, it's like it's limitless. Um, when I sell a set of these to somebody who's never heard one, I almost always get an email back and say, Jim, I, 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 I trust you, <laughs> but I didn't believe you fully. Oh my God, the detail is just insane. Now, audiophiles love detail. I talked about that. Um, so the problem with the tongues, the, the whole series of 6SN7 tongue saws is that they, just like we were talking earlier about the Marconi G, GTBs, is that they, they have a higher noise ratio, they're more common to find a tube that's noisy, it's more common to find mismatched tubes electrically. Once they get through the electrical test and the live amp test, I do that with any tube that I have amps for, before I ship. <laughs> um, if they get through all that testing, they tend to be good. I rarely have a problem afterwards. But that's one of the reasons why some of these vintage tubes are so darn expensive, because there's such a high failure rate before they're ready for sale. Okay. Well, I think I saved the best for last. Let's see if we've got enough time. Hang on. We're going to be really quick here. This is probably one of the last boxes to make it out of uh, southeastern Ukraine before the war started. Uh, they were shipped uh, a week before the war started, I think. And this is a full box of power tubes. Up here, we've got one of my favorite logos for Soviet-era tubes. This is the Flying or Winged Sea. That's the Svetlana logo. I've never heard a bad Svetlana tube. And in Cyrillic, it's 6 pi 1 pi dash eb. Now, I'm not sure why the Russians use the pi symbol. Maybe it's just uh, it works better in their alphabet. Maybe it was just a good symbol to throw in because it's very distinctive. You can't make a mistake with it. Anyways, we translate the pi to just a p in English. It's not the same, of course, but we, that's how we do it. So this is 6p. 1p dash e b e v. We our um, R V is their B. So and this is a mil spec designation. Um, and the the V on the end is for vibration. So it's a it's a tube that can take a lot of abuse. It's a mil spec tube, of course, so that makes sense. And the E is the long life designator. So th that's really great. So these are all from 1989, just before the collapse of the Soviet Union. The years after the collapse are kind of iffy for some manufacturers, but I've never seen a bad Svetlana from those years. So maybe Svetlana was fine. A true St. Petersburg Svetlana. Be careful. There's of the common power tubes like the EL34, KT88, 6550, there are many fakes. So watch out. Often with uh, Soviet era tubes, they would put a, a whole pile of data sheets in with the pinouts and everything. Neat, eh? Let's just look at one quickly. I'm almost out of time here and you're getting bored. <laughs> I've never bought a full box of Soviet era tubes in this good a shape. They're pristine. They're beautifully wrapped. They're inside a little cardboard sleeve, inside a divider, inside nice corrugated plywood and cardboard. <laughs> Have a look at these. Mill spec tubes come with um, come with tin pins, which really helps for an older tube. Um, makes for really good connectivity and no corrosion. And of course, we got the famous label and the date code right here on them. And somebody's actually signed off on every single tube has somebody's initials. Uh, in the old days, they used to do a paint stamp or they would do a paint dot or a paint dot in the middle here. Um, this is near the end of the Soviet era, so they just use a marker. And um, this is the tube that Charles and I have chosen for the headphone uh, amplifier and 
And we're really hopeful that this is going to sound as good as many of the Svetlana tubes that we've used in the past. We've made a big investment in a lot of them, so hopefully they do. But Charles's design is finished and he's going to start the layout. We're going to start working on the top plates soon. But there's so much going on, who knows when it's ready for actual test builders. But we're going to eventually need test builders. Isn't that going to be fun? Um, and, hang on, if you stay till the very end, I've got some discount codes to help you out. Remember, I've got flat rate shipping of $20 around the world. And if your order's up, $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on me. And I forgot to mention that the store has a new uh, server host. Uh, the volume in the store doubled in one month, and it slowed the store right down. I got kicked out of my own store, and I'm an admin. <laughs> Anyways, uh, Charles fixed it last night. The store is now running 30 times faster than it was before. It's virtually instant. It's like a miracle. <laughs> I don't know how many hours I lost in the last month just waiting for pages to reload. Anyways, my apologies to everyone who was patiently waiting to get in and around the store. Have fun, everyone. This is Jim from Valves and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.